So, uh, hello everyone. Can you hear me? Okay. So I'm here today on behalf of Professor Juarez, who was invited to present some of our work today, but could not. Thank you. So uh, Professor Juarez could not come today, so he asked me to show some of our work, uh, particularly I uh, presented our work on the Van der Waals heterostructures. So thank you for the organizers for, for having me here. Uh, so uh, first of all, a, a brief introduction just to contextualize the importance of this uh, two-dimensional uh, transition method by Cocogenides. They are in the context of the great efforts that have been done since the past decade on these two-dimensional materials since the discovery of graphene, that uh, these materials are defined by this uh, single or uh, few atom thickness, which opens the way for, for new phenomena and new investigations in, in, in physics. And since the discovery of graphene, new uh, novel two-dimensional materials, other alternatives for two-dimensional materials were searched for, uh, in particular, one class of compounds that uh, attract a lot of attention is this uh, TMD, transition method dicocogenides, which are defined by this MQ2 composition. And, uh, and where we have a transition metal in this uh, calcogen, sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, which offers a wide diversity of possible chemical composition and, as such, a wide diversity of uh, uh, physical properties. Is it better now? Okay, I will. Um, so, uh, and so the, the, one of the most important properties of this uh, transition method of cogenides in the context of two-dimensional materials is that they are, contrary to graphene, they are natural <laughs> semiconductors. So that's, that's the main um, feature that attracts a lot of attention to these materials. And uh, with that comes a wide variety of uh, properties that uh, has motivated a lot of potential applications in this, in this nanostructures of TMDs, two-dimensional TMDs, going from sensing to energy applications to biomedicine applications. And in particular, the class of uh, compounds, the class of materials that I will discuss today are these uh, Van der Waals heterostructures. Because if you think about the vast uh, library of two-dimensional materials that you can obtain uh, with TMDs or even other uh, two-dimensional materials, you can combine these two-dimensional materials without the, the strict uh, lattice match, match uh, requirements of standard materials. Because if you stack uh, different two-dimensional materials, you do not have the, a strong chemical bonding in the interface, in the vertical uh, direction. So in principle, you do not be uh, restricted by this, this matching that you have in traditional uh, materials. So uh, these are the, the materials that people have been proposing, these Van der Waals heterostructures. And uh, with that, uh, novel applications for this, for instance, illustrated here is the application in, in uh, light absorbing or light emitting uh, heterostructures. So uh, in particular, um, uh, I will describe here some of our efforts in, in three different topics of these uh, materials. Uh, we are interested in first the topic is to understand the role of the interlayer coupling in the electronic properties of these materials. So um, uh, and the different the second topic that we are, we are interested in investigating is how to understand the dynamics of the interlayer charge carry transfer in these uh, uh, hetero bilayers or heterostructures. And at last, well, I will give some, some results that we have on the optoelectronic properties of uh, these Van der Waals hetero bilayers, uh, including genus TMDs, which I will, I will describe in a minute. So I will give, uh, give now a, a general overview of all the methods that were employed along all these investigations. Uh, and I will comment uh, along of the talk which of the specific methods were, were applied uh, to obtain this result. So we, we applied, uh, most of these calculations were based on, on density functional theory, uh, standard density functional theory with a standard exchange correlation functions, such as the LDA, PBE, and the hybrid functions to correct band gaps. We have also uh, the uh, Van der Waals corrections on top of the, the total energies because we are dealing with uh, this uh, weak uh, interacting system, so this type of corrections can improve the results on the structural properties and energetic properties. Uh, going beyond standard DFT, we, as I said before, we are also interested in understanding dynamics of uh, charge carry transfer, for, so it's important to include some type of uh, time-dependent simulation, so we did that using the framework of time-dependent density functional theory, 
In particular, we use the, um, this implementation called TDAP package, which is built on top of Siesta, that uses the, the, the time-dependent uh, uh, Conchon scheme to, to uh, evolve the Conchon orbitals with time. Uh, using, in this case, this uh, uh, local basis orbital, as described here. So we have this equation to, that describes the time evolution of the coefficients. And then, along with the simulation, the, the, the dynamics of the ions is treated within the framework of uh, IFS dynamics. That is, in this case, the, the, the dynamics of the, the nuclei is a classical dynamic simulation using the, the updated density of the, the time-evolved the, uh, time conscious orbitals. And the last part, we also are interested in improving the description of opt optical properties uh, comparing with a standard DFT, for instance. And if you think about doing this in, in a many body a picture, it would require uh, a high computational cost. We try to uh, overcome these issues by using this proposing this scheme, combining the tight binding, Hamiltonian, or uh, obtained with the Vanian 90 package that gives us a single uh, particle Hamiltonian from electrons and holes. And then you combine these Hamiltonians with the, the Coulomb, uh, Coulomb interaction to obtain the exton Hamiltonian. And uh, in this, uh, we obtain in this, in this scheme the, the Betz-Salpeter uh, formalism to describe the, the, the extons. And with that, we, get, we get, can get, for instance, the exton ground state energy. And most importantly, in that we'll discuss today, is the, the electric matrix, and which gives us the absorption spectra of the systems. So the first uh, a point that I would like to discuss today is this effect of the interlayer coupling on the band gap. So if you think about this van der Waals heterostructure, as I said, we have only this weak interactions between the stacked layers. So um, people have been using it. You, you find a lot of results, for instance, in, in DFT calculations in the literature that tries to uh, predict the properties of the van der Waals heterostructures, in, in this case specifically heterobilayers based solely on the, on the properties of the, the, the non-layers that compose this uh, heterobilayers, and based uh, um, uh, on the, the picture of Anderson's rule. So the idea here is simply that you have two isolated monolayers, monolayer A and monolayer B, and the, uh, based on this Anderson's rule approximation, you assume that the, the band edges uh, of these of this, uh, monolayers with respect to the, to the same vacuum level will be kept when you form the heterojunctions. So based on that, you can, uh, based on that, and assuming that the electronic coupling in this uh, weakly interacting layers is weak, you uh, can define the, this band gap, predict the band gap for the heterobilayer based on the band alignment of the natural band of sets of the monolayer. So in this case here, we can predict a band gap based on the difference between the lower uh, conduction band mi minima and the highest valence band maxima between the two uh, monolayers. But, uh, uh, of course, uh, it, it does not uh, could represent exactly the result of the, the real monolayer, the real heterobilayer, sorry. So what we are trying to investigate here is how good is this approximation and which effects can lead to deviations from this approximation. And to do that, we selected uh, these uh, uh, six monolayers to be investigated. We have the monolayer sulfide and monolayer diselenide. Uh, which in, appear in the 2 age phase of the uh, TMDs, and also the selenizing sulfides of nickel and platinum, which appear in the 1T phase of the, of the TMDs. Uh, uh, within the, uh, the, our approximations, all of these uh, monolayers have non-zero band gaps, and so they are, they are uh, useful to perform this test in our to perform this investigation that we are interested in doing. Uh, first point that I would like to comment is that to perform the simulations, we have to, to build a common uh, lattice for both monolayers, in this case that we're dealing with uh, heterobilayers. And, and if you look at the, the, the lattice parameters that we have along our, our set of monolayers, you have some large difference among these lattice parameters. So you have to, to find the best way to find a common uh, cell that describes both lattices of these monolayers. And we did that by searching for a smaller matching cell, uh, allowing for rotations, which uh, or, or interlayer rotations that allow us to, to minimize the size of the required cell. And so the, this interlayer rotation was not the same for all of the heterobilayers that we simulated. We have a, la a large uh, variety of, of angles, which is also uh, uh, nice. So we can see that for the results that I described here, this effect of interlayer rotation is not the critical issue for the, for the, the interpretation of the results. And this was done with this uh, cell match software, and we allowed for a maximum of 100 atoms in the unit cell to, 
to save the computational time. And we do not want to use a large strain on the mon layers because we do not want to, to go too far from the, the ground state properties of the, of the mon layers without strain. And so we, we found, found this, this supercells for all these combinations between that six mono layers that I described before. And if you look at the results that, that we have for the interlayer distances and the, the binding energies, we get the range that is typical for uh, this um, weakly interacting systems in this, in this, in this uh, class of approximation. So we can define that we have a weak interlayer binding in, this, in all these heterobilayers that we simulated. So what we do now is that uh, we can compare our predictions for the band gaps based on Anderson's rule with the actual band gaps that we get from our calculations. And uh, just as some definitions here, so what I define as the Anderson rule band gap is just as I uh, mentioned before, is the difference between the lower conduction band minima and the higher uh, valence band maxima. And we compare it with the uh, direct calculation band gap, is that we perform the calculation for the heterobilayer and uh, get this band gap. So these results are shown in this graph here, which is ordered based on the difference between the uh, Anderson rule band gap and the direct calculation. We see that uh, for the cases uh, um, with the green background, we have the, that the band gaps are decreased by more than 0.1 eV, and we also have some cases where the band gap is increased by more than, more than 0.1 eV. We have some cases in the middle here, which are smaller deviations. We have some, some good um, agreement for, for a few cases. But what we are trying to see now is what leads to these deviations that are not uh, uh, neglect neglectable. So we have some uh, deviations from an answer rule that cannot be neglected. And so what we are trying to understand is what leads to these deviations? What are the physical mechanisms behind this, these effects? And the first case that we observe is that is focused on the, the systems where the band gap is decreased. And to understand this, we have to observe this uh, interfacial hybridizations. And just to, to exemplify this effect, we selected, uh, I select here, a single heterobilayer of nickel disulfide and platinum disulfide. And this band structure that we see here on top, the color, the color scale is, is based on a projection, of a local projection of the, state, the electronic states on each of the layers. So a blue for uh, uh, nickel disulfide, a red for platinum disulfide, and uh, the, the intermediate colors are projections or, uh, on both layers. And we can compare this band structure with the, the, the band structures of the two monolayers in the same supercell that we used to build this heterobilayer. And we want to see this because we can, we can see that uh, between these two monolayers, the one with the higher VBM is the, the nickel disulfide, which is close here to minus 60 V, close to the gamma point. And we see that we still have these this states here close to the, to the gamma point. But the states that now define the VBM of this heterobi the heterobilayer are not, uh, are not confined to a single monolayer and comes from, a, from a, a projection from both layers, which indicates as this state uh, is above the, the state from the previous monolayers and is uh, delocalized among the two monolayers, that this comes from an from a interfacial hybridization of the, the electronic states. And to, to, in this effect, you can look at here and see that they are primarily originated from PZ states of the calcogen orbitals, because these are the states that uh, are, are projected outside of the monolayers in the stacking direction. And this scheme here represents how this effect can lead to this band gap uh, decrease. So I selected here two monolayers, and uh, I show the, the states that are mainly involved in this interfacial hybridization. If you have a two-age monolayer, these states are the DZ square and PZ states of the calcogen. But if you have a 1T monolayer, it's solely the, the calcogen PZ states. And the same for the other monolayer. So you will have uh, a decrease in the band gap if the, the energy splitting of the, the two states, that I call here this ES parameter, is higher than the difference between the, the original uh, uh, state that is being, that's interacting and the original VBM. So if ES is higher than alpha, you will have a, a decrease in the band gap. And uh, we measure this effect by looking at all of these monolayers that we calculated to obtain the ES parameter and the delta E, the energy of the two interacting levels, and get the, the, the expected trends of the, 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 the levels. You see that the, the magnitude of the splitting is proportional to, the, to the, the difference between the energies. And interestingly, we see that the splitting is higher to have two uh, one-t monolayers interacting because, as you saw, it is are mainly composed of the PZ states, which are in the interfacial region. So this explains what, why this interaction is, is stronger in this case. 
But the fact that I mentioned before is mainly uh, responsible for the decrease in the band gap, but we also saw some cases where the, the band gap increases. And, and these uh, uh, cases correspond to type two junctions, junctions where the, the VBM is, lo is, is localized in one monolayer and the VBM is in the other monolayer. So what can explain this, this uh, increase in the band gap is, some, is the buildup of an interfacial dipole. Although we have this weak junction, this dipole can have some large magnitude and lead to a, to a relative level shift that increases the band gap. So if we com combine the two effects that we have, the, the total band gap change might come from this uh, interfacial dipole that's built up and the, the band gap decrease due to the uh, hybridization. And this is indeed what we observe in this curve here. We plotted the, the, the difference between the two band gaps, the Anderson's rule and the direct calculation, and these two quantities that we get from our, from our models, the dipole shift and the, the, the upshift of the VBM. And we see some good agreement here. The only difference is the, the, the junction built with two uh, platinum calcogenides because this is a single case where some uh, uh, significant hybridization occurs in the conduction band minima. That does not, that's not, was not taken into account here. And uh, some, some other interesting point that we observe here is that, okay, we, we saw this, this understanding that we have some weakly interacting uh, uh, layers, but uh, since we do not expect some strong chemical bonding in the interface, what explains the origin of this dipole, this interfacial dipole? And we can explain that based on a simple model if we take into account that uh, this, uh, this dipole comes solely from the change of the environment of the, the, that leads to the decay of the wave function. So for instance, take a monolayer A, uh, uh, isolated, no heterobilayer here, and if you consider this, uh, describe this uh, edge state with a single wave function, you have this model based on this uh, potential step that leads to the decay of the, of the wave function proportional to the exponential <laughs> decay proportion to the square root of the, the, the potential step. When you build the, the uh, heterobilayer, we can uh, model this, this change of environment if you do not consider strong binding or strong chemical interactions based solely on the change of this potential step height. Now, instead of the vacuum, we have here the, the next uh, empty state of the other monolayer, which leads to the difference now between the, the VBM of one layer and the CBM of the other layer. And this leads to a change in the decay rate of the wave function outside the monolayer. But we have to remember that this occurs only on one side of the monolayer, the other side will, will still decay as before, and le this leads to a, to a dipole uh, that comes from this monolayer, and we also have to combine this effect with the, the change in the decay rate of, mon of the, the density of monolayer B. And if you sum up these two effects and integrate, you have some, some dipole that should be proportional to this quantity, where uh, chi A is the, the, the uh, electronic affinity, which you model as the, the conduction band minima with respect to vacuum, and the phi, phi is the uh, valence band maxima with respect to vacuum, the ionization potential. And uh, indeed, we can calculate these quantities based on the isolated monolayers and the, the dipole that we get from our calculations and see some, some uh, interesting correlation here as, as expected. Uh, uh, I point out that this results for the nickel and platinum heterojunctions here, the blue circles, they deviate more from the, from the trends and uh, some, some interpretation for that is that as I showed before that the, the interaction is, uh, the, the hybridization interaction is stronger in this case this leads to a buildup of charge accumulated on, on the nickel sulfide case. So up to now I've been describing this uh, uh, solely no dynamics of charge carry, solely try to understand the, the formation of the heterojunction, and now we uh, we're turn our attention to understanding some, some dynamics of these uh, charge carriers in this heterojunction. And to do that, we selected one uh, heterobilayer, which is the mol molybdenum sulfide platinum, the selenide, and try to, to understand the simulation. And, and why doing that? Uh, just uh, to point out that this, this type of investigations have been done since the, the interest for this two-dimensional materials. And people have been finding that, surprisingly, they have this uh, ultra-fast uh, uh, charge carrier transfer in this, in this heterobilayers. So our goal now is to go beyond the mostly common investigated uh, type 2 heterojunctions and investigate the type 1 junction, in our case, the molybdenum sulfide platinum disenide where we expect that uh, an excitation occurring in the molybdenum sulfide uh, monolayer would lead to a transfer of electrons and holes to the uh, platinum deselenide layer uh, via um, uh, energy relaxation. 
And this was done by using this, this uh, time-dependent density functional theory uh, framework that I described uh, <coughs> a minute ago. So uh, just a description of the properties of the heterobilayer that we investigated. We have the 2 h molybdenum sulfide and 1T platinum diselenide. This was calculated with the LBA properties. And we see here the, the type 1 junction, uh, as I mentioned before, where the, the VBM and CBM are, are confined to the platinum diselenide layer. And we build this heterobilayer by using this uh, supercells for the, for the uh, monolayers which end up with, uh, I think, uh, 138 atoms with a small strain in this 6.6 uh, .6 interlayer twist. And uh, the, the, the feature here of this uh, band structure is uh, similar to the one I showed before. We had the formation of this VBM that is delocalized among the two layers in this case. But we still have this feature of the type 1 junction. We see that the molybdenum disulfide band edges are confined among the states that are localized in the platinum decilinide layer. So this is still uh, uh, a good example to study this, this charged density relaxation in, the, in this type 1 junction. We simulate a photo excitation in this case by promoting an electron from the monolayer, from the MOS2 VBM to the CBM, and then study the, uh, the time evolution of this uh, charge carrier occupation. And so how we study this, this, this uh, time evolution of the charge carrier, so we have the, the conscient states, the time evolved conscient states, and we remember that these are, are local basis orbitals. So to study the time evolution of the, the electrons and whole occupation, we perform a projection of these uh, states onto the, the basis orbitals that are in one or the other layer. So in particular, we are interested in seeing how the, the, the electron and whole occupation evolves in the platinum decilinide layer. So remember that it starts all in the molybdenum disulfide. So we see that, indeed, the occupation of electrons and holes increase in the, in the platinum disilinide layer, as expected. But we see some marked difference in the rate of transfer of electrons and holes. So what you, we are seeing here is effectively a, a mechanism of charge separation in this, in this type 1 junction, as, as uh, depicted here. So although we, we have the transfer of both electrons and holes, electrons transfer much faster, which leads to a, to a charge separation. And so our next goal is to um, uh, try to understand what leads to the difference between the, the behaviors of uh, electrons and holes. And this can be seen by this uh, results here. So what is being shown here is the, the time evolution of the energies along the, the, the simulation. So the red is the electron state. In, in blue, we have the, the, sorry, in blue, we have the electron state. And in red, the whole state in the simulation. First, just to point out that if we perform the simulation by clamping the position of the ions, we do not see nothing uh, happening. So uh, the, 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 the energy relaxation here he occurs via, via phonons. So this is an important point. And also we see that uh, this difference in energy that we see in the VBM between the whole state and the states where it should relax is much higher than the, the gap we have in the conduction band. So what leads to the difference between the <coughs> Electrons and holes uh, uh, decay rate is a phonon bottleneck effect because we do not have enough phonons to relax the, the, the energy of the, the holes. And so, uh, contrary to expected, this energy, the, the, this, uh, the whole energy here is not decreasing, so tr the transfer for charge occurs to this uh, lower energy states and not to the higher energy electron states as expected. And also, we see that an important mechanism for the, for the increased rate of electron transfer is this uh, cross, level crossing close to 60 femtoseconds here that corresponds to a, to a more effective intermixing of states between the, the, the states in the uh, molybdenum disulfide layer and platinum decilinide layer, which increases the rate of electron transfer compared to, to uh, whole transfer. And just to, to, to point uh, our last results here uh, is an investigation that we performed on the Van der Waals bilayers with Janus uh, uh, transition metal dicoplagenides. So this Janus team, these are just these types of monolayers where we can synthesize uh, a TMD monolayer where, where we have, uh, we will replace one layer of calcogen for, the, for other calcogen. For instance, you can have sulfur here and selenium in the bottom layer. So this leads to an important property of, for instance, the buildup of an intrinsic electric dipole in the monolayer, which uh, uh, leads to important, in, interesting properties in this in these materials. And so uh, we uh, looked into these properties of a lot of uh, bilayers that we can com obtain by combining these different monolayers here. Uh, I will not describe all.
results that we have here, I'm focusing on the properties, on the electro electronic and optical properties. And firstly, just to, to mention that here we still have the, the type of mechanisms that I just described. So we see here it's somewhat more beautifully because we have uh, this smaller unit cells. And also pointing out that we have a role, an important role of the interfacial anions on the buildup of this skin. For instance, if you compare the same two uh, uh, monolayers, molybdenum disulfide that is Janus monolayer with uh, selenium and sulfur, by only changing the, the orientation of the, the Janus monolayer with respect to the molybdenum disulfide, you get an important uh, change in, the, the, in this hybridization effect in the, between the, the two monolayers. And uh, the other important point that uh, I'd like to comment is the, the role of the, of course, uh, this is where the that, that description I mentioned based on the uh, BSC framework is used to derive the, the absorption spectra of this, this uh, heterobilayers. So here in, in red, you can see, for instance, that this is the obtained with a single uh, particle framework, and we can compare with the, the, the black curve, which includes extonic effects. And one important point here is as expected, the key extons uh, that have uh, strong optical activity come from interlayer transitions, and we see that by comparing this spectra with the spectra of the monolayer. So as expected, uh, uh, interlayer transitions are the, 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 the lead to the most important contributions to the, to the absorption. But we see some cases where we have some uh, not uh, neglectable uh, optical response from uh, interlayer uh, extons with lower energy than the, the interlayer transitions, which might lead to, to strategies to tune this optical response, for instance, by applying some electric field to, to maximize this, this uh, optical response. And one important uh, feature that we might get by providing this, this improved description of the optical properties of these heterobilayers is the insights into the, the uh, solar energy conversion efficiency of these heterobilayers, which is one of the, the main important uh, properties that have been, been looked at in these in this types of materials. People have been building these this heterojunctions and try to use this as solar cell devices. So uh, if, you look, if you go to the literature, you see a, a diverse set of, of um, methods that you can use to try to predict what type of efficiency you might get with these devices. Uh, you have, of course, some, some deficiencies in all of these models. Uh, for instance, if you do not have an accurate description of the optical absorption, you would not uh, be able to include uh, a correct description of the optical absorption in your prediction of the, the, the solar cell efficiency. So <coughs> uh, we include this, this, all these effects via the spectroscopy limited maximum efficiency framework, uh, which has been proposed quite some time ago, that, that requires that you have some accurate description of the light absorption and also it takes into account the thickness of the, the your system and also some uh, recombination fraction of the charge carriers. And by using this methodology with, with our results of the, the optical absorption, including extonic effects, we get some power conversion efficiency of these materials that range from 0.5% to 3%. Of course, this is, is very small compared to the traditional materials in solar cells, but we have to remember that this is only a few nanometer thicknesses. So you cannot think this is a material based for a large scale application solar cell, but for target applications where you have a small mass of material with a, a higher power yield. And this is, a, and we also point out that this is in the range that people have been seeing for uh, based on experimental uh, setups for this uh, heterojunctions. And also, uh, just to point out that more than predicting this uh, uh, power conversion efficiencies, we can see. With which factors are the main limiting factors for the, the limited uh, power conversion efficiency of these materials. Uh, in this case, apart from the thickness, of course, we have the important uh, contribution of this recombination fraction that occurs when you have this buildup of the uh, interfacial hybridizations that leads to the, the, the buildup of these indirect band gaps that might contribute to the lowering the efficiency of these devices. So uh, with that, I conclude. Just to summarize, we have shown the mechanisms that lead to band gap deviation from Anderson's rule in, in Van der Waals heterobilayers. We have also showed uh, uh, the charge carrier evolution in this type 1 junction, showing an effective mechanism for the charge separation in this junction, and also provide this framework to, to obtain the optoelectronic opto properties of Van der Waals heterobilayers, uh, including Janus TMDs, and highlighted the importance of these materials in the, the electronic properties. 
and also use this to obtain insights into the, the PC values, the power conversion efficiency. So uh, with that, I acknowledge the, the funding, the support, and you for the attention. Do you have questions? Thank you, Rafael. Uh, when you, you uh, do the calculations uh, without using the Anderson approximation, uh, with, 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 you do rotate the, the, the layer, one layer in, in relation to the other because maybe that's the only way you can do such, such a calculation. And uh, you say that uh, this rotation don't, don't play any crucial uh, element in your in your conclusion, but then you you say that the the import, one of the important things is the, is the hybridization in the z direction, and I, I would expect when you rotate you can change a little bit uh, at least the hybridization. Could you comment on that? Sure, uh, of course. Uh, good point. Uh, when I said that uh, the the, the interlayer rotation is not important for the effect. Perhaps it's more uh, correct to say that it, it is, does not play an important role in the magnitude of the effect. The effect is still there, but it might uh, lead to a minimization of the effect by uh, decreasing the overlap of the, the uh, calculated methods, for instance, in the two model layers. Hi, Rafael. Nice talk. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is uh, I didn't understand the mechanism that uh, uh, raises. Uh, the valence band in this, in this hybridization. Uh, can you explain? OK, so uh, wh what happens here is a simple uh, 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 hybridization of the orbitals. You have one orbital from one monolayer and the other monolayer. And yeah. w what comes up from this interaction is the different state that was not originally there that forms upon yeah, the, the Yeah, but pattern. why is it so big? Uh, in K point, you have a. Uh, a very big difference from from the actual the initial ones, and the, in in the gamma point, you don't have a, at least a, a change. Yeah. Okay. In this case, we have to see w what states are interacting to originate the the this, this interaction. So, if you look at the, the gamma point <coughs> here, it's what composed this state originally is a px plus a py state that are confined to the to the plane. And so it does not interact uh, so strongly with the, the stacking direction. So this is. So then, then the, the middle one are, are interaction very, very strong. You mentioned this one. Uh, no, the, uh, the states that that goes on the k point is different from the gamma point. Is that, is that so? Yes, you can yeah, see so, by this. So they interact you... strongly. Yes. If, if we, what we see here is that this, as I mentioned, we have the, the strong interactions come from these PZ states. That's that's below yeah. the VBM here and here. So if you look at the states that, sorry, that uh, originally formed the VBM of nickel disulfide, they are still here because they are confined to the, to the layer plane. So they are, they are not strongly interacting. OK. And the second one is about the Jan, Janus. Uh, here, that, that one. The, the, go back. Uh, why the first one and the third one are, are different? So what changes here is the, is the orientation of the, the two layers. Uh, actually, I, I think that uh, I selected a bad example here because it, what's changing here is the orientation. So let me explain what oh, the orientation Oh, it's the orientation. Is. Yes. In this case, we have uh, selenium on the top layer, uh, molybdenum, and then sulfur, and then sulfur and selenium in the bottom layer. And here we have sulfur, selenium, and selenium at the interface. And uh, what changes here is the interface. Here we have two sulfurs in the ah, interface. Ah, OK. So you have two sulfurs and two seleniums. Okay. Yes. OK. So now I understand. Thank you. Any further questions? So if not, let's thank the speaker and uh, move on. So the next speaker is Guilherme Cipari from Instituto de Física de São Carlos.